Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Permaculture Student. I am Matt Powers. Thank you so much for joining us. We're talking today about the cow pee. And do you guys know that it's the year of the cow pee? Yeah, it's the year of the cow pee. So celebrate cow peas, get informed, get educated, figure out why we're celebrating this amazing, amazing plant. So the cow pee, as you can see here, comes in many colors. You probably know it most famously as a black eyed pea. They're all, there's all these different varieties here. Um, I've got, I don't know how many, as you can see the water dripping off of it. I soaked it overnight. And so they're, they're quite enlarged actually. They're swollen with water. And so they've got the water they need when I plant them now to power them through so they can get their root and get into the soil and then get another source of water. So this kind of like, they've got the food, right? That's what the seed is. It's got the food with it, but now it's got the water to carry it through. So that's a very important thing that I've always done in this drier climate. I'm now in Southern California. This is a site that needs a lot of repair. It's very um, smashed with a lot of uh, perennial plants, a lot of overgrown plants. I can't do very much. You know, usually we, we find ourselves with restrictions on a site. One of the things I can do um, is I can plant cow peas and, you know, chop and drop them for mulch and repair areas and make areas beautiful. So the great thing about cow peas is they're an incredible nitro nitrogen fixer and biomass accumulator. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they're fixing, uh, they're sequestering carbon at huge rates. Uh, they're fixing it in their bio, they're sequestering their biomass, and then if you turn that into soil, it turns all that carbon into soil. It also means that they pair well, incredibly well, with corn and other things that are nitrogen hogs or you know heavy nitrogen users. So, cow peas are also really low in phytic acids. So uh, if you if you have problems with digestion with beans and stuff. Maybe eat the bean greens because they, uh, they, they've got a bioavailable um, zinc, I want to say. Uh, I, I have a talk on this with an expert on, uh, at Baker Creek uh, on, the, on their feed with Jamie Jackson about it. She's an expert on all, all this. She's the one who educated me about the finer points of cowpea. I really like it because it changes landscapes. It changes landscapes rapidly. So in other words, with compost tea, cowpeas, maybe daikon radishes and buckwheat, uh, you can create an incredible change in your soil. And you can go from basically tan dirt to rich, well-structured, beautiful coffee-colored soil that goes, you know, feet deep. And, you know, inoculating um, th this, you know, your peas or your beans or whatever, any of your legumes that you plant with appropriate um, rhizobium uh, bacteria and that's the, that's the nitrogen fixing bacteria. That's what makes these nitrogen fixers. It's really critical. Because if it's not in the soil, then these will, won't do the, the, the full effect. You know, that it's like you're not activating, you're not turning on the TV, and you're watching a movie and it's like, wow, it's not working. Yeah, you gotta get those bacteria going and turn the electricity uh, in, in the economy of the soil. So always make sure to do that. This, I love cow peas. I can't get enough of cow peas. Um, they're a beautiful plant, they're a happy plant, they are a vigorous plant, and they're gracefully, you know, willing to bow out of the way, because you can just chop and drop them and they don't come back. So a lot of people like worry about using a perennial, you know, green manure crop. They're like, yeah, but that'll just take over. That clover, just take over. But you know, when you work with cow peas, for because it's a summer, a lot of people, we, we all know, we all know about the winter cover crops. We all know about fava beans and peas and winter peas. You know, we all know about that. But this is your summer green manure that, you know, doesn't become invasive and it's inedible. So don't neglect for yourself, don't neglect um, yourself the cow pea. Uh, it, it really is great because it, it works well with almost everything. You know, it pairs well uh, in a, uh, a Three Sisters environment. It really works well uh, just on edges. It climbs things well. Here, let me adjust the camera so you can see what I'm doing next stage here. All right. So we've got this area. This is where all my fig trees come from, by the way, in my system up in Central California. All of them were cuttings off of this tree. And because I did that for several years, it's grown about six feet. So 
when we stress plants, right, a lot of the time they respond, especially ones that are old and wise like, like this fig tree. And, it, and this tree has gone on to, you know, not just, not just my yard, but many, many people's yards. And it's awesome, you know, like these legacy plants that we have in our yards, they, they can go and feed families, you know, all over the place and just keep going. I love it. All right. So to prepare for cow peas, there's a few different things you can do. If you don't want to disturb the soil much, you can literally just kind of do that and then take the cow peas individually and just plug them in. That's one way to do it. And that's probably um, going to release the least amount of carbon because it's almost like you're plugging up the hole that you just made, you know? I just do, 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 and then the holes are, are gone so there's no carbon real, real release. The other way, which is much more common, and um, you would definitely need to uh, mulch afterwards, like a light scatter mulch. I don't have that handy, but I want to say that beforehand so you don't forget and don't just watch me <laughs> uh, and then, then forget that. So you can rake the area up um, and you don't want to go very deep. You want to go, I'm just going that much. That's not even a full inch um, deep. So I don't want to go very deep because that just ruins everything really, <laughs> really. Um, and then, so, and then I would just throw it down, you know, and then I'll show you how dense I want it because because I want it dense. It's really important. And then you know what? Watch right over here. I'll just leave these ones. We'll check back on these in a, uh, on another morning, and we'll see the growth and we'll see the difference in how these things are growing. So these ones I'll just throw so on the ground, unbroken, and we'll see how their roots do. In comparison, um, there's a soaker hose on this spot. It doesn't reach very far, but it will reach enough once these, because they're soaked. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna jump for me. Uh, they're cowpies. They're, they're, they're smart. <laughs> so let me just adjust this right here. Actually, let's, let's go look at it. You guys can join me over. Ooh. All right, let's be graceful here. So right here, you can just see how it's just on the ground. There's no protection, it's just all on the ground. Over here, actually, you probably can't see them, but those are the embedded ones right there. And those are just filling in those holes that I made, right? They're not even, even fully, you know what I mean? They're not even fully uh, covered. These right here, we could go like this. And, and then we would be able to see the difference between these that are slightly covered and then those that have open ground but aren't covered. So I usually do this all the time. So why would I do this all the time? You're, you're probably asking why would you, you know, run all these experiments on your plants? I thought, I thought you, you knew the method. I thought there was the method and the book. And we do the inch. What's going on? Well. You know, I mean, I've discovered that everything is depends. <laughs> um, almost all of our like rules um, can be bent and stretched and shrunk and all these different cool things because plants are intelligent, uh, especially if you uh, save their seeds and you work with land races, like all those plants, right? All those, all those are going to act like a land race. And we're going to, and I'm going to start building a land race. That's what I do. Is I gather 12, 12 different kinds of one variety, and then I start growing them together. And it and it mimics a land race where some years, you know, these you know these ones over here will do really great in a drought, and then some years these over here uh, will do really great when there's a lot of water. And it's the same exact thing over there. A land race does the same thing. With some plants, they'll easily cross and create that land race. Instead of mimicking the land race, you'll actually have one. So um, I did that with mustard. I got mustard from all around the world and it crossed and actually grabbed some of the kale into it and mixed and made some really interesting um, kale mustard crosses that were really delicious. Um, don't be afraid of crosses. Uh, remember, farmers love hybrid vigor, right? 
And then on the flip side, we have uh, people who are like, must be true to see, da da da, it'll taste awful of the crosses. So it's like, well, it's, which, which one's true? Well, what I've discovered is um, there's no bad tasting squash, especially like when you're creating land races and crossing them and getting all this variety. Um, there's so many, all right, and then different flavors and textures among plants is different culinary applications. I mean, like, let's be honest. You go look at French cuisine, they've got like recipes that are based around the time of year for the eggs. They're like, oh, is it winter egg? Well, winter egg is this, these recipes. It's like, oh, is it hard rind a summer squash? Oh, well, that's this, that's starch here. That's the reason it's harder on the rind. Oh, is it? Oh, is it like super soft? Is it like that summer squash so like a squish and rots really easily? Oh, well, that's this. We're making bread with that, or we're gonna be making uh, dried, you know, squash uh, sections like Buffalo Bird Woman, and we're going to be making uh, soup with it in the winter. It all really depends, and it all starts with us saving our own seed. So I teach all these sorts of things in my courses. I've just created a way to have four courses, um, and I'm about to have many more courses available online. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm like lowering all my prices. I'm creating all these new courses, all these new resources. I have people all over the world asking me to create curriculums now that pair with my books. So like lesson plan based curriculums. Uh, so I'm creating summer camp curriculums, charter school curriculums, eighth grade, fourth and fifth grade, eleventh to twelfth grade set curriculums so that they can actually use it in the school like this year. Um, we, we have tons of things on the horizon. There's so many things on the horizon. I have this thing called decentralization orientation and it's a way that I'm going to help facilitate and it's not, I'm creating these facilitative activities uh, that can be replicated everywhere that reorganize by having everyone else do it themselves, not me. Um, facilitating these um, regenerative uh, collaborations. So for instance, decentralization or, uh, orientation, we get businesses together and then we start talking about our inputs, our outputs, our areas, and our audiences. And then suddenly, we're like, oh wait, we're all on the same route, aren't we? Why don't we just share a delivery truck? Because I'm like carting around half a delivery truck stuff, you're doing that too. Why don't we just share a delivery guy and we both pay him a little bit? And it's like, boom, suddenly that guy's getting paid a little bit more, same route, a little bit more stuff, meets some more people, and then suddenly, you know what I mean? It becomes a synergistic thing where everyone along the steps of the way does better. Meanwhile, you're streamlining your business, saving money, uh, stuff like that. So creating business guilds, creating business ecologies. So you're like, if I could expand and I can't because I'm doing all this stuff, I would do this and this. So I'd really love it if someone came and did this and this. Like someone needs to, uh, be a bottle washer in San Diego area. If we had a bottle washer, we could be recycling, the, reusing the bottles, not recycling, they're not crushing them down, wasting all that energy and building new bottles. Instead, we could just be washing them and then using them again like all of Europe does, right? I mean, those bottles are used again and again, have all that character and you can just tell. So, things like that, just like that, we could start tomorrow, everywhere, all over the place. So I'm working on that, creating a model. Um, I'm in a discussion right now with Frank Goldbeck of uh, Gold Coast Mead. Do you guys know Frank Goldbeck? He's an amazing entrepreneur. He's the kind of guy that's helped five other people start the same exact business, and other mead shops and meaderies uh, all throughout San Diego. So yeah, good, good, good guy, good things. We're planning on, uh, you know, testing this idea, the decentralization orientation soon. So it's very exciting. And then I've got this free live class this Saturday morning, you guys should all come, 10 a.m. Pacific time in San Diego. If you're here in San Diego, just come, it's free. It's at the World Beat Center in Balboa Park. So there's free parking across the street. Just come and just park across the street, walk across the street, walk in. Hi, grab a seat, I'll be on stage. We'll be talking, it'll be live. I'll answer your questions live. People can you know, ask questions from here online too. It'll be a lot of fun. So this Saturday at 10, and actually every first Saturday of the month, I'll be at the World Beat Center giving free classes. We'll be doing decentralization orientation, 
uh, not this month, uh, uh, and not next month, but uh, uh, the month after that. I'll be doing the five steps to an abundant future next month. This month it's an introduction to permaculture. Next month it's five steps to an abundant future, which really simplifies things and clarifies our talking points when dealing with people who don't understand permaculture, who don't understand all this vocabulary that we're using. That's fine. We just have five steps. It's really clear. We're building soils, growing forests, restoring the oceans and waters and bodies of water, restoring, regenerating biodiversity and then rewilding human culture. If we just can get those into everyone's head, we'll have a clear path of where we need to go, what we need to do, and then we can start discussing how we're gonna do it in our local bioregions. So it's gonna be different for everyone, and we have to have the people actually do it themselves. Because it's not gonna have like one person who's like the, the dictator savior who comes in as like, da, 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 da. you do this and you do that and like tells everyone what to do it's no that's that's like never worked and that's why we have the problem we have today so forget all that you are your savior you are your hero in your local community in your family in your neighborhood in your own life for yourself it is your actions today that are the answers to people's prayers, the answers to people's problems, all these things. We are the solution. So now we have to go out, share that information, and then inspire people to work with us to create new patterns and new systems. And we can do it. It can spread so fast. I mean, just think about this whole thing about the national parks, you know, uh, being opened up. What if this was an opportunity for us to manage them even better? What if it was an opportunity for the states because overwhelming response from the people said, no, you're not gonna like give those up. We're going to claim them as states and we're going to you know, make them bee preserves and pollinator preserves and like, amp up the natural habitat and you know, restore their watersheds, you know, restore the actual biodiversity, not just plant trees that we're gonna cut down for timber. I mean, really, we need to plant trees for biodiversity. We can't, I mean, go to the forest, look at the, the you know, it's a monoculture. This is the problem. It's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous, simplified ecology because we planted it, because we chopped it down already um, in, in most of the places in America. So we need to use all these like crazy things that are happening, these dislocations, these disconnections that are happening as opportunities to not plug back into where we were, but to plug into something infinitely better. So this is where we're at. I'm really excited. Uh, in my own life, I feel like I'm finally arriving to a place where I'm totally meant to be. I feel like super excited and ecstatic to share all this information with you guys because I know where it will go, where it will lead. and. The sky's the limit. I mean, we're right at this moment where we're about to break into so many schools. People are just waiting for this. We're at this moment where businesses are coming to like all these leaders in permaculture and regenerative work and, and you know, all, and they're saying, okay, now how do we actually do this? Write up a business plan, make a proposal. Everyone is becoming ready. You guys saw that Cargill just got rid of all its feedlots. It just got out of the feedlot business and it gets getting out of, you know, it's, there's, people are realizing it because the education is going for it. So keep spreading the message, keep living regeneratively, keep living openly and with passion so that people see that you love it, that you know that you're making a difference, that you know that what you're doing is right and empowering and they will follow you and they will find their own joy in it and then it will spread even further and farther so thank you so much I will see you guys again soon I'll probably see you guys this afternoon actually yeah I'm seeing you guys this afternoon it's Wednesday so Wednesday at 3 o'clock we're gonna be giving away um, it's very special I talked about it earlier it's gonna be my adapted Pisco Rantu Chispy Land Race Corn it will be only one person so uh, it's going to be it's going to be hard to 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 choose but we're going to uh, we're, i'm going to create a contest I, i'm not going to announce it now i don't want you guys to prepare but 
I'm going to be giving away some of our precious, precious corn. There's not much left. I've got it growing in a dozen sites now all over America. Um, the last one of the last place I'll be planting it is down in the World Beat Center in San Diego. But this is an incredible corn. We're going to be doing it. It is my purple speckled, right? The purple speckled Peruvian corn. I'll be giving it away to one person today. I'll be talking about it this afternoon. So I'll see you at three o'clock Pacific time. And thank you guys for living regeneratively and choosing this path because wherever you are, no matter where, where you are, there's more you can do, right? There's a progression, we all can do it. So thank you and have a wonderful day and I'll see you later.